Our Pax Christi icon was gifted to us as an international movement for peace in 1999 when we had our international council in Jerusalem. And it had been gifted to us from a monastery working outside of Jerusalem to help us to reflect in a different way, in a different quality on the task of peacemaking and reconciliation in our world. And I'm now going to pass on to one of our members, Anne Fard, to lead us through a meditation with the icon. Thank you, Pat. Um, before we go into the meditation, I'd just like to mention that there are resources relating to the icon over there on the bench. You have a prayer card in front of you, I think, on your, as, on, on your seat, and you will need the card at the end of this meditation. There is also a pack that goes with the icon, which has all the background information and information about the people in the icon, and that's available for sale over there, and there's a poster that comes with it. And also, you will have a little leaflet which says that if you would like to borrow the icon for your church or your group or your school, then you can um, fill in the form and negotiate with the office and they will arrange the times when this could be done. And I would recommend that. It's a very, very special icon to have um, in any place and the, um, the whole atmosphere that it seems to generate is something very, very special. So now having travelled, having got very wet, trying to find buses and places to park, let's just close our eyes for a minute and first of all calm our bodies. in this space. We're gathered together as a group in the presence of God and on each other. And the icon of Christ our reconciliation. silent. Be still. Say nothing. Ask nothing. Be still and let your God look upon you. Let your God love you. And we will listen to God speaking to us, both in the silence and through the icon of reconciliation. If you'd like to focus on the icon and make sure that you're sitting where you can see the pictures. <coughs> and I hope that you'll come up and have a good look afterwards at the different uh, people who are in it. And all the people in the icon, both from the New and the Old Testament, are teaching us something, saying something to us. Across the middle we have Christ our Reconciliation written. And at the bottom we have Jesus in the heavenly Jerusalem teaching 
the Lord's Prayer, and it's written there in Aramaic. On the top left and right, we have St. Stephen and Mary Magdalene. Then on the left, we have Boris and Gleb, Eastern Orthodox saints. On the other side, we have Sophia and her daughters, Faith and Charity. On this level, we have St. Francis and St. Clare. And then underneath, we have Sarah and Isaac, Hagar and Ishmael, the woman at the well, and the Syrophoenician woman. There is information about all of those people in, 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 in these sheets on here. For the moment, let's have a look at Esau and Jacob. You see that they're embracing each other and they have their feet on the sword. The sword is put down. And we remember that in the story, Jacob, with the connivance of his mother, his mother Sarah, tricked his father Isaac into giving him his wealth and inheritance. Jacob went off and lived with an uncle. He married, had a family, became rich. But after living for many years with the guilt of what he had done, he decided to uproot his family and leave all that he and his family knew well and travel back to the man that he had left. That was going back into the unknown, approaching his brother and the wider family. We imagine that he was probably full of fear at doing that. And after a long journey, he and other members of his party saw that Esau the Waste was coming towards him with a large band of men, and that increased their fear. But the astonishing thing is, of course, that Esau welcomed him back, embraced him, and peace was made between them. They were reconciled. It was the one who was hurt who reached out to forgive and made it happen in reality. For ourselves, we remember that reconciliation is often a very long and difficult journey. The willingness to forgive doesn't always lead to forgiveness, or it may take a very long time. And for many, it is a daily journey through the pain of what has hurt them. For a moment, just look at the picture and see what it's saying to you. What is it that's hurting you at the moment? What do you want to forgive? And what do you need to be able to do that? If you move your focus now onto the lower part of the icon, to the two pictures underneath the easel, and we see Sarah and Hagar, both 
those with their children. Interestingly, Abraham is missing from the icon. He's not been put in this. And Hagar was a young slave girl from Egypt. She was a possession. Sarah's personal slave. A young girl who was then given by Sarah to the elderly Abraham to conceive the child that Sarah and Abraham wanted. Hagar was deprived of any choice. Deprived of personal dignity. And then suffering the anger, the resentment and the jealousy of Sarah when she conceived. Hagar was banished from the household twice and left to wander in the desert with her child. And at the time when her food and her water was gone, she just waited, expecting her child to die. But at that very lowest point in her life, God spoke to Hagar and promised to protect her and her son, her son Ishmael. She looked up when she saw an oasis and a well. Water was provided. She was saved and her son grew up, was healthy and has many descendants. He's seen as the father of the Muslim people, as Abraham is seen as the father of the Jewish people. Christians, Muslims and Jews have their roots in Abraham. Looking at the picture, what's it saying to you? Who or what saved you at a low moment in your life? Looking at the two bottom pictures, the woman at the well and the Syrophoenician woman, we have two women who challenged Jesus. Both women who would not normally expect to be spoken to by a Jewish man. So in both instances, Jesus broke the conventions of the time, went against the rules and regulations. For the woman at the well, he went, he was sitting there thirsty, Jacob's well, some of you may know it, it's very near Nauvoo in the West Bank. Sitting there at the heart of the village, the well at the well that was providing essential water. When the woman came to draw water, Jesus asked her for a drink, and she was really astonished at this. She really didn't expect to be spoken to by this man. That astonishment provoked a, an outburst from her. And after that, he talked to her about the living water, the water that would bring eternal life. And actually, she mildly ridicules him. But then she challenges, and then she asks him for living water. We remember that Jesus crossed the boundaries and he entered into a serious conversation with her. And he finally told her, an outsider, that he was the Messiah. The Sarah Phoenician woman also challenged him. She asked him to cure her child. But the woman's outside the accepted Jewish circle, and Jesus didn't see this as part of his work. 
not part of his mission. And when he replies that this is not his work, he has to feed the children first, not the house dogs. She challenges him and says, even the house dogs can eat the children's scraps. He listens and he really hears what she has to say. And he learns from her that no one group is more important <coughs> than another. No one people is more important than another. And then Jesus says to her, you may go home happy, and her child is cured. Looking at those pictures again, what are they saying to you? And who or what is challenging you at this moment? In the four pictures, in the middle section, Morris and Claire, Sophia and her daughters, Francis and Claire, we have people who are dedicating their lives to peace. We have people who refuse to take up arms, refused to fight. <coughs> St. Stephen, we know, is the first martyr of the church. And then on the top corner, Mary Magdalene, who we'll look at now. She was an early follower of Jesus, having come with him from Galilee, and she provided for his needs out of her own pocket. Having met Jesus, things were never the same again for her. And she was not afraid of the consequences of being with Jesus. And she was with him to the bitter end, at the cross with his mother, facing the shame, the failure, the fear that had sent others into hiding. She was at the tomb before dawn, and there she was called to do something new and totally unexpected. Again, against the conventions of the time, she was charged with the most momentous task. The first witness of the resurrection, she was told to take the message of the resurrection to the men, and so to the whole world. As we look at these pictures, we ask ourselves what, it say, what they're saying to us, and ask, what are we being called to do? Is in the prayer, the response is simply, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray that, like Hagar, we shall hear when God speaks to us, speaking to us through those we meet each day, through the lives they live, the stories they tell and through their uniqueness. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray that when we're tired, when we're tired of seeing the endless bad news and the pain caused to the vulnerable and the poor and those that we work with, we shall look up and see the oasis and the well that is there for us when we are most in need. Lord, hear our prayer. 
We pray that like Esau and Jacob, we will have the courage to work towards forgiving those who have hurt us and hope that we will be forgiven hurt that we have caused. Lord, We pray for all, particularly children, who are frightened, taken against their will, abused, cast out, trafficked. Lord, We pray that like the woman at the well and the Syrophoenician woman, we shall have the courage to break down barriers and cross boundaries of culture, race and religion, and that we will speak out and act when we see injustice. We pray too for all those bound by the constraints of culture, race and religion, for those who use these to punish others and for those who suffer as a result. Lord, hear our Lord. We pray for all who are forced to leave their homes and their countries and seek refuge and sanctuary in unknown places. And pray for all those who give them sanctuary and refuge. Lord, hear Remembering Francis and Claire, Boris and Claire, we pray that we will be able to support those who refuse to take our arms. And we pray for an end to the arms trade. Lord, hear We pray that like Jesus, we will listen be able and be able to respond with justice to whatever challenges us. And we pray that like Mary Magdalene, we shall have the confidence to take the good news to others and to be your peacemakers. Lord, as Jesus is teaching his friends in the heavenly Jerusalem, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we pray for justice and freedom for all peoples, both in Palestine and Israel, and all who live in areas of conflict. If you would like to name any person or any place aloud that we can include in our prayers, just name the person or the place. We pray together the prayer on the back of the icon card. <coughs> o risen Christ, we believe your Holy Spirit, and you tell us if it is your will, according to ourselves, your peace, and in the name of our Lord. Thank you. 
experiences through the rest of the day and all the experiences that we'll have and then outwards into our communities where we know 